Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening uh, church service. Uh, please open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 16. Luke, chapter 16. <clears throat> and we are going to be reading several verses. I invite you to follow along. Luke chapter 16. We'll start in verse 19 and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Although we're reading quite a few verses, I uh, won't be preaching from all of those verses, but I do want us to have a little bit of a context and background here. And then uh, uh, I don't believe I'll be going super long. There's a point that, that I'm wanting to bring out here, and I don't think it'll take real long to, to make that point. Let's read these verses. <clears throat> Very familiar passage. Luke 16, beginning verse 19. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, its truth, its power. God, we pray that tonight as we, as we come to your word, that uh, you would speak to us through it, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and open our, our eyes, our ears, our minds to its truth, and that we would allow it to work in us. Lord, may we be helped and strengthened by it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to make a point here before I get into tonight's message, and that is a lot of people have used this passage to say, well, see, rich people don't go to heaven, and poor people automatically go to heaven. That's not what's being taught here. Um, in fact, Abraham himself was a, a wealthy person, and it tells us that he was in, in heaven, so to speak. And, and so that's not the message of this, and being rich doesn't send you to hell, and being poor doesn't take you to heaven. What makes the difference between heaven and hell for you is what you have done with Jesus. If you have accepted him and made him the savior of your life, if you placed your faith in the price that he paid on the cross for you in his death, his shed blood, and his resurrection, <clears throat> that's what you've placed your faith in, and based on that faith you've asked him to save you, the Bible says you'll be saved. That's all there is to it. If you've rejected him, and, and by rejected, you say, well, I've never told him no. You don't have to tell him no. If you haven't told him yes, then by default you've told him we're born in the state of condemnation. We're born in that condition. And, and so something has to be actively done to take us out of that condition. Um, and so we're born separated from God. We, we're born as sinners in this world. Now, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's what makes the difference between, between whether you spend eternity in heaven or you spend eternity in hell. But that's not tonight's message. I wanted to make sure that that, that was clear, lest somebody read this and say, well, I'm poor, I guess I'm going to heaven. And a lot of people have read that passage and they said, well, 
uh, uh, they said, I, I've, I've got a lot of poverty in my life, so that, that must mean I'm going to heaven. That's not what this passage is teaching. That's not what the Bible teaches anywhere in it. The one thing I want to bring out here, though, is that sometimes people, our society tends to value people based on their net worth. And the fact that we have that term, net worth, shows that, uh, uh, that there is a value, that there is an importance that's placed on that aspect of somebody's life or somebody's existence. And, and um, I, I was looking up some information this afternoon on uh, uh, <clears throat> our next uh, gubernatorial race here in Ohio, and I've seen some signs in people's yards, and so I always like to start researching who's going to be running, and, and that way I can kind of make a decision on, on who to vote for. And I was looking for, for you know, who all is going to be running for governor. And one of the candidates uh, looked up and it had some information about him. And it said his net worth was 34, over $34 million is his personal net worth. And it started showing his resume. And this guy's been, all he's ever been is a politician at some level, some, some shape or form or another. And, and I thought, wow, there's, there's a lot of money in that. Uh, and uh, which would explain why a lot of people go in and why they, they fight so hard to keep their place and, and uh, why they're willing to do anything. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Anyways, let's get back to our message here. Something I want to point out here and, and, and show just the contrast here. And, and it's not necessarily the focus or the scope of this passage or the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach with this, uh, with this account. I don't want to call it a story, uh, and it's certainly not a parable. Usually, uh, a lot of times in the Bible, it said Jesus spake a parable unto this end, and, and then they would give us the parable. Uh, but this is uh, generally held as not a parable, simply because it names somebody by name. And there's some specifics given uh, about it. And that's kind of what I want to get into. I, I, I underlined a line here years ago in my Bible and wrote a note out in the, in the margin, and it said this. God values the poor enough to name them. We notice that. It says uh, in verse 19, there was a certain rich man. A certain rich man. And perhaps the people in that area automatically thought of somebody by name. He didn't have to say the rich man's name. Most people know who the wealthy are. And, and uh, uh, I was working a crossword puzzle the other day, and it said, uh, um, wealthy, per wealthy man who, um, uh, what was it, invented windows. And then, you know, it was easy, Bill Gates. Um, and, of course, the invention of windows could be, <coughs> could be argued there, but, but he's identified. And, and I could name some other people, and we would uh, automatically, okay, those people are certainly wealthy people. They're, they're, they, they would count as a rich person uh, by anybody's account, by anybody's comparison. And there's, there's, uh, they're famous because of that. They're famous because of the amount of money, the amount of net worth that that person has. Years ago when, when uh, Bill Gates was kind of being persecuted by the government because he hadn't, he hadn't given any campaign contributions to any politicians, and so they said, well, we're going to break up your company. I thought, wouldn't it be funny if he just shut his company down, bought an island, and went and lived happily ever after? And, uh, of course, he didn't do that. He started giving money to the Democrats and giving money to the Republicans, and all of a sudden his political problems went away. And really that's all that they were after. They didn't care how Microsoft and, and Windows was, was structured. They didn't care about that at all. They cared that he wasn't giving them money. Once he started giving them money... All those problems. He didn't change anything the way he was doing and structuring anything. Anyways, here it says, uh, There was a certain rich man. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. And he fared sumptuously every day. There was not a, a single day where this certain rich man went without. There wasn't a day that he missed a meal. There wasn't a day that he wondered where the payment was going to come from to, to pay for something, where the money was going to come from to pay for the house where he lived or to pay for his clothing or to feed his, not just himself, but his household. And, and there, it was, it was, there was an abundance, and that's, what, that's where he lived. 
And you know, there's some people that, that live that way. Uh, they have no idea. They have no idea. Uh, they have no, I should say, they have no care. I mean, they, they may have a good idea of their affairs and how much money they have, but they, they have no worry or, or care about it. Um, you know, if something, if there's a downturn in the economy, they're not going to lose their house. They're not going to lose their car. If, if, uh, if something happens to go wrong, if there's a hiccup. And this man, he fares sumptuously every day. Every day, every day. And then it goes on in the next verse, verse 20, it says, And there was a certain beggar, so there was a certain rich man, whatever his name was, but there was a certain beggar, and God said, his name was Lazarus. And it's interesting, we know many wealthy people of our country by name. Many wealthy people. I mean, multi-millionaires. In fact, there's a show with, with a, a panel of, of multi-millionaires, and some of them are billionaires, and, and the whole show is dedicated on them looking for things that they can invest their money in and help other people get their businesses going and, 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 and grow them and both make some money out of, out of the situation. We could, we could uh, if I said George Soros, that name would be identified with a lot of money. Uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, that name identified with a lot of money. Nancy Pelosi and her husband, whom she says, I don't want anybody investigating his stock market dealings. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of money, very, very wealthy. President Joe Biden and his son, millions and millions and millions of dollars have come into their hands. And, and, um, and these people have a lot of money. Bill Gates, a lot of money. Steve Jobs, before he passed away, a lot of money. And, and there's, there's just a whole, Elon Musk, you say he has a lot of money, and, and so on, and the list would go on and on and on and on and on. And uh, we know those names, but can we name one beggar? One beggar. In fact, some of our cities and some of our states in this country have made it illegal for somebody to stand on the, a street corner along the sidewalk and ask people that are going by for money. They have a name for it, panhandling. They say that's, that's illegal in some cities. It's illegal in some states. So not only do, do they want that activity discouraged, they make it illegal, and, and so now people aren't allowed to be beggars. But we, do we know the name of, of one? And it shows the difference in where God pays attention. And God values the poor enough. And throughout the Bible, he talks about dealing with the poor. He talks about dealing with the widows. He talks about dealing with, with those that are, are in and of themselves helpless. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. That word that's translated poor in Matthew 5, 3 is translated beggar in Luke 16, verse 20. Same original word, same Greek word in one place. Due to context, it's translated as the poor, uh, but here it's translated as beggar. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, let's turn there. Uh, <clears throat> since we're already in Luke, we won't have very far to go. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 uh, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is, of course, Jesus speaking. He begins to preach, and he says, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And so Jesus said, hey, one of the main things God wanted to, to make sure that I did was come to preach to the poor. And, and uh, uh, well, what about the wealthy people? I'll tell you one thing that I know from personal experience is the poor people will pay attention, a lot more attention to the preacher than the wealthy people will. And, and as, as missionaries, my parents tried to reach, uh, they, they went into one neighborhood, very poor people, poverty-stricken area of town, and, and people would come to church. You'd invite them, they'd come to church. They went into what would be middle to upper middle class, and, and tried, to, tried to get a church started there. 
And it was very, very difficult to get anybody to come to the services. Very difficult. And it was hard to find them at home and on the weekends because they had enough money to where they could buy a little bit of property out of town. And, and like so many Americans, will go camping on the weekends. And so if you try to find them at home on the weekend, they're not home. And Jesus said, God anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way. And tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And so God made it a point to, to list them. And it's something you notice, know, it's, it's well. The lepers are healed. The dead are raised. That's wonderful. That's great. And he said, I'll tell you what else is great. I'll tell you who else has caught my eye. I'll tell you who else has caught my attention. The poor. In Mark chapter 12, and then again in, in Luke 21, Jesus drew attention to a lady who was referred to as a poor widow. Again, that same word translated as beggar in Luke chapter 16 was translated poor to describe this widow. And he said, look at, look, at that, look at that poor widow there. She gave more money in the offering plate than anybody else all day long. And there was people that had shown up and they had, they had a bag full of money and they, they held that bag up and they turned it over and poured all those coins out into the offering plate and, and they wanted people to see how much money they were giving. And this poor little widow lady, she walked up to the offering plate and she put her one coin in. And the reason Jesus said she put more in is because she gave everything she had. She didn't give leftovers. She didn't give, well, I've got all this extra money I don't know what to do with. I'm going to give that. She gave all that she had. But Jesus drew attention to somebody who was poor. And I, I make this statement, I set all this groundwork to, to kind of make one statement, and that's don't let your financial situation interfere with your relationship with God and your service for Him. Lazarus was an extreme case of poverty. Lazarus didn't even have enough money to go to the doctor. His doctor was a dog or a, a few dogs. They came, he was so bad, they came, and he couldn't get salve for the sores, for the ulcers that he had. The only relief he could get was go ahead and let the dogs lick. He was so poor, he desired to be fed from the crumbs that fell from that rich man's table whatever they tossed out, whatever leftovers he could get to before those same dogs got to him, that's what he got to eat. In Colombia, it's not against the law to panhandle. And there are people all over. You go downtown and all up and down the sidewalks, there are people that, that beg. And, and one of the things they'll say, if you give them some money, if you help them out a little bit, They'll say, may God repay you, because they can't. There was a man who would come by our house from time to time, one of the, one of the homes we lived in, and he'd knock on the door. He, he walked with crutches because he only had one leg. And he, he would ask for some, for some food. And mom would fix him a meal, and he would sit down, and he would eat that food. And, and we took care of him, and, and <clears throat> it was a, uh, one day of the week, and I can't remember which day, but, but it was every week he'd come by. He said, I know where, where I can get fed. I know where I can get a meal. And Now, there's some people who, who can work and choose not to, and God said, if you're just going to be lazy, you need to be hungry. But then there's others that are truly poor, 
and can't. But I want you to know, however poor you are or however wealthy you aren't, don't think God doesn't see you because you have a small bank account. Don't think for a minute that God's not interested in you because you don't have as much as somebody else that you may have gone to school with. Well, I went to school with that guy, and look, he went, to, he went on to a, 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 an expensive college, and now he's got this big degree, and what success he has, and what a big house he has, and look at all the cars in his driveway, and, and he's got, he's got uh, uh, his kids have newer and more expensive cars than what I can afford for me. And God could really use somebody like that. And God, I'm sure God's interested in somebody like that. God's interested in you. Well, I don't have as much. And my house is not as big. And my house is not as new. And it's not as fancy. And it's not furnished as nicely. And in fact, my furniture was new to somebody else before it was new to me. And my car was new to several other people before it was ever new to me. And, and, and I, I'm thinking... My kids are going to be 24 before they ever need to get a driver's license because there's not going to be anything for them to drive until they can buy it themselves. And, and, and I, I just, I don't think God's really all that interested in my life. Well, he didn't name the rich man. He named the beggar. Is it because God didn't know the rich man's name? No, God knows everybody's name. But God said, the rich man doesn't need attention drawn to him. I want you to know that I see the beggar. He has my attention as well. It's, it's clear. Wealthy people draw attention. A, a few years back, I was in a, a minor car accident. It, there was no injuries involved. Um, it, it, was, it was a minor accident. Somebody ran into me. They, they, they turned. I don't know. They weren't paying attention. They got nervous or something, and they, they ran into me. They were at fault. <clears throat> it didn't make the newspapers. It didn't make Channel 6 News. It didn't even make our local Morrow County newspaper, and that would have, I mean, that's almost news. You know, when they, they used to list people's birthdays throughout different towns in the county, it didn't even make that. But a wealthy person, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, gets in a vehicle accident, and it's all over the news. I mean, that happened way out on the left coast, and it's shown up in news here. See, they automatically get attention. And we, we say, well, that's understandable. That's a celebrity. That's somebody that's famous. That's somebody that's wealthy. And God says, I want you to know that even if you're poor and you don't have as much as other people, you still have my attention. You still have my attention. Well, who is the Son of God going to come and preach to? And Jesus said, you tell John, the poor are getting the gospel preached to them. Go back and tell John. Go tell John, hey, there's somebody. And, and why would he do that? Because John would say, I know who that is. That's who I've been preparing. That's who I've been announcing. That's who I've been telling everybody about. The Messiah is coming. That was John the Baptist's job. That was his, his calling from, from before birth that he was going to prepare the way and announce, hey, the Messiah is coming. Any minute now, he's going to come on the scene. And Jesus said, go tell him what you've seen. What did we see? We saw something different. We saw the poor getting some attention. Oh, if we could just get some Hollywood actors saved. Well, I'll tell you what would happen. They'd, they'd be unemployed pretty quick. Why don't we say, if we could just get the gospel to a beggar, somebody who's poor. I'm so glad that nobody waited until my family reached a specific social status before sharing the gospel with them. I'm so glad nobody looked at, at, at uh, uh, my dad's dad and said, well, someday when you're making more than a dollar a day, Come see us and we'll tell you the good news. I'm 
glad nobody checked them at the door and kept them from coming inside and said, y'all are just too poor to be in here. I'm glad that gospel was preached to those in poverty. I'm glad God notices even if you don't have a lot of money. And God said, go out and call the poor. It's interesting. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to preach the gospel to the poor. But rich people, they all came to Jesus. They didn't have to be called. They didn't have to be invited. They would just show up. But the poor, the poor, the widows, the homeless, the fatherless, God names them and points them out and draws attention to them and says, there's a special place in my heart for them. What encouragement. I don't have to be wealthy for God to see me. I don't have to have a big account for God to be interested in me. I don't have to reach a certain status and, and, and a, a fame and, and celebrity uh, status for God to finally say, okay, you can let him in. You can make this available to him. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He said, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To the poor. What a wonderful thing for God to love even me. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your love your care not just for those for whom we would say well that's obvious it's easy to be interested in them but God for the rest of us those whom the world would say well they're plain there's nothing outstanding about them they're, they're, they're just there well they might even look and say they're poor They've had to beg for food at times. They've had to ask for help. There's been times where they weren't going to make it without somebody handing something out to them. But we know you love us. And we know you wanted the gospel preached to even us. God, thank you for that. For that great love that Jesus died for even me. May we always be mindful of that. May we be mindful as we interact with others who may not be quite as, as blessed financially as we ourselves are. We might remember that you love even them. And that your desire is for your gospel, the good news, to be shared with all. May this be firmly ingrained into our hearts, our minds, and our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you.